biblical word study, and uh, if, if you uh, haven't been with us, we've been going through different words in the Bible and um, looking at what they actually mean, looking at how they're used in the Scripture, because how can you understand the Bible if you don't understand the words that are in the Bible? And so we've been teaching uh, not only how to uh, how to get an accurate definition, but also we've been defining some often misunderstood or misused words or words that are, are not often used in our English language and therefore um, very easy to not know the correct one. So tonight, this the words that we're doing tonight uh, were suggested or were requested by a member of the congregation uh, that, we, um, that we cover, and I'm going to cover it. And they actually are in the continued class tonight. Perfect timing. So they're going to watch it on YouTube later or on Facebook, one of the two, and do that. So uh, it's always great when you wait and wait and wait, and then we finally get to it, and you're, you're not in the room for it. So hopefully there, I will leave no questions behind uh, that uh, they weren't in here to ask. So let's open with a word of prayer tonight, and it's good to see all of you. It's good to have uh, my friend Pastor Todd Miller here. He's uh, from Steel Valley Baptist Church in Brilliant, Ohio. Yes, he's uh, down southeast corner. Uh, you're cl you're only about an hour, less than an hour outside of Pittsburgh. You said so. Yeah, so uh, he's uh, over that away, and Todd and his wife Rebecca and I and my wife and I went to college together at Maslin, and we're part of that Maslin group. That's tearing something up. We don't know if we're tearing the devil up or we're tearing the church up, but we're tearing something up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, and as we study again tonight, we pray that you give us wisdom as we open open the Word of God and, and look at these things. We pray that you be with the Spanish service next door, the continue class, the teens, the kids, the nurseries. Uh, Lord, a lot going on around the building as every room is in use tonight, and we ask that you would um, just uh, uh, help us to continue to move forward as a congregation, and Lord, uh, as, as we just dropped off another 12,500 John and Romans yesterday, Lord, again, we ask that you would prepare the hearts of those that will receive the copies of the Word of God, uh, and that uh, we would, they would find some fertile soil uh, where they would, uh, that seed would germinate and grow, and uh, we would see people saved through it. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, we are, uh, again, we're, we're going to cover tonight um, the words desire and lust. Um, somebody asked for, for me to take these two words and study it. We've got, um, uh, I was going to limit it, and I am limiting it to 13, so technically we still have three more weeks. I do have a little bit of room. Uh, if you had something, if you had something you would like me to define um, or do a word study on, then I do have some room remaining for that, and uh, I think I've covered about all of them that I really wanted to. I have a couple other that I'm uh, going to be planning on doing, but I could always bump one or two of them if needed. So, so write it down on a Pew Connection card if you have any words that you want to do a word study on. Just write it on the Connection card. You can either hand it to me or um, uh, just uh, drop it in the offering box and it'll eventually get to me. So, all right. Well, we're going to look at this. And again, um, going through here, this, th this is an interesting, the fact that lust and desire were, you know, could you do those two words? Um, it's interesting because this gives me the opportunity to demonstrate um, something that uh, is, uh, is, is part of it. And sometimes the same word can be translated different ways throughout the Bible. Uh, one example of this is the word agape, which is generally in the New Testament translated as love, but in 1 Corinthians 13, it is translated as charity. And the reason for it is there's a distinction in the context of 13, 1 Corinthians 13, that is unique from the other references to it. So charity in, is distinct from the idea of love or God's love in that this is charity is God's love that we show to other people. Uh, and so there is a different word that's translated to show the uniqueness of that context. 
that makes sense? So again, we're, we, we don't speak Hebrew, we don't speak Greek, and what might have automatically made sense or in their, their context using the word agape was no problem and it was discernible, the intent and the, and the meaning behind the word. Sometimes in English you lose a little bit of that and so the translators use different words to properly convey the context. Okay, and so this is one of those um, instances where you have basically the same words that are translated both lust and desire, and the context kind of indicates why they chose one word over the other when they translated it, and they typically had a, you know, a very, uh, a very, what's the word, a formula, um, a, a process that they went through and they would come to this word, and are we going to translate it lust? Are we going to translate it desire? In the context, what are we talking about? And they would work through that to come up with the correct English word to convey the meaning <coughs> to us. And so we're going to look at a bunch of words tonight. Uh, and so this one's a little different than what we've done in the past where we look at a word and it's translated righteousness all the time, and then we look at another word and it's translated justify. Uh, this, we're going to look at the words and we're going to see that they're translated both ways and, um, and then we'll look at the scripture itself. So uh, we have the word ava uh, and it, in the Hebrew it it's, appears 26 times in the Old Testament. It's translated desire 14 times and lust four times, long uh, three times and covet twice. And it just means desire to an incline or an inclination uh, covet, wait longingly, wish, sigh, want, be greedy, prefer. You get the idea that it's, it has to do with, you know, uh, of I desire something, I want something, I'm waiting for something, and depending on uh, the context, it's either translated as desire or lust or longed or covet. Um, and each of those words has a different implication for us. So that's one word. And there's a bunch of them, and I'm not even going to get into all the different, um, all the different forms of the words. Um, but um, eva, which is very similar, there's just an extra v in there, uh, which creates a, a second syllable to it, really. And it's translated lust. Uh, I'm sorry, it's translated desire three times, lust after three times, pleasure one time, total of seven times. And again, it means desire, lust or the will, it refers to, to somebody's will, uh, and it not necessarily evil. Um, this is not in a negative context. It can be used either way, but these words don't, <coughs> the, the root words themselves, or the, the Hebrew words themselves, don't denote necessarily e, uh, an evil context or a good context. The text itself denotes that, and then from there, usually the negative is translated as lust, and the positive is desire, uh, or longed after, or um, that. But lust and covet tend to have a negative context. We understand those words as you don't want to be a covetous person. Uh, you don't want to be a lustful person. Okay. Um, so the context kind of separates that out, but in the Hebrew, the, the, context, the word itself does not separate it out. The, the understanding of the word, whether it's negative or positive, is always derived from the context. Are we talking about uh, you know, a de desiring another man's wife? Well, that's covetousness, that's lust, that's in the negative sense. Are we talking about desiring the word of God? Well, that's in the positive. We wouldn't say we're lusting after the word of God. That's just the, not in English how we would, would say that. Um, you have, again, another very similar word, and it's tava'ah, and uh, it's translated desire 13 times, lust one time, greedily one time, pleasant one time, and four other miscellaneous translations for a total of 20 times in the Old Testament. Again, it means the desire, a wish, longing of one's heart, this one tends to carry more of the negative context to it, um, more so than the others. So <clears throat> while some of the other ones don't necessarily indicate that, this one tends to, you know, something that, you know, we're longing after that really is not a good thing is typically where this word gets, um, gets brought out. 
Um, and then the fourth word, these are just the four main ones in the Old Testament, uh, is komad, which is translated desire 11 times, covet four times, delight twice, pleasant, beauty, lust, uh, delectable things one time, 21 times it appears in our King James Bible. And it just means to desire, to covet, take pleasure in, delight in. So you see all four of these words basically mean the same thing with very, very minor distinctions to them. Uh, and they're all translated both as desire and lust in our King James Bible, just depending, again, on the context of it. But they all mean just to desire something uh, or to covet or to take pleasure in or delight in or long after. These are all um, common themes that we see throughout there, and these are the four main Old Testament words and what they mean. We'll look, at, uh, we'll look at some passages of Scripture here in a minute. <clears throat> so let's look at the New Testament side of this. And the words in the New Testament are usually not any easier to pronounce than the words in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Epithumeo, and, uh, or A-O is the end of that. Um, and it is appears 16 times in the New Testament, eight times as desire, three times as covet, three times as lust, one time as lust after, and one time as fame. Um, and I believe that where it is translated fame is in with the prodigal son, and fame to you know to fill his belly um, in that where he's hungry and he's desiring food. Um, <clears throat> it just it means to turn upon a thing to have a desire for, to long for, to desire, to lust after, to covet things forbidden. So you can have, you can have a positive or a negative context to this, again, depending on how it's being used. Um, another word, very, uh, well, no, I didn't, see, I didn't put that other slide in there. Okay, um, epithumio, uh, epithumia, one is O and the other is A. Ah. Very similar, but it appears 38 times. It's translated lust 31 times. It's translated concupiscence three times, uh, which is concupiscence is an evil desire, a sexual desire, uh, desire three times and lust after one time. So most of the time this word is translated, it's, it's in, all in the negative sense. Uh, it means a craving, a desire um, for what is forbidden. Uh, and it's, like I said, usually translated as lust. <clears throat> Before we look at a bunch of pa different passages, anybody have any questions about that? It's going to be my shortest lesson yet, unless I get a bunch of questions, because this is a complicated and the application is very simple, and so it'll go down very quickly. All right, I gave you a chance. Now you have to listen to me. Okay, so I have on the screen some, um, some examples. Uh, if uh, I have some volunteers to read, we'll look up uh, a few more. Would somebody like to look up Genesis 3, 6? All right, Chris. And um, <clears throat> all these are passages where either one of, the, one of the four words in the Old Testament or one of the two words in the New Testament that they pop up and they're translated different ways. So you can kind of get a sense of how they're being used in the scripture, and we can see if the definition that we've given to them fits the context of the scripture. So, Chris, would you read Genesis 3, 6? <clears throat> okay, and so, again, the law of first mention first time this particular word appears, and uh, does anybody pick up what word, how it was translated? Do you need to read that again? Read that again, Chris. Yes. Just read the, read the verse again. What's, what's the word there? Right. She saw that it was a tree. It was a tree to be desired. Um, it was something to be longed for. It was something to, uh, you know, to be hoped for. 
And again, this is in, depending on how you want to portray the context, could be in a good or a bad thing. She saw it, now it was forbidden, but she saw it as, as good for food, and desiring food is not necessarily a bad thing. But God had said, not this food, and that's what made it a bad thing. And so it is translated desired here rather than lust, you know, as something to be lusted after. Uh, no, she, she saw it as desirable. She saw it, though it was forbidden, in a good context. Some, it, was, it was food. It was good, pleasant to the eyes. It was good. It was food. She should have it. It was going to make her wise. She saw it as something good. God said it was bad, but she thought it was good. And so it's, it's accurately translated what her mindset was. That's why they didn't, didn't choose the word lust here, even though it's after something bad because she didn't see it as bad. She saw it as good. She didn't see it as the forbidden. She saw it as something that would improve her quality of life. Satan deceived her into seeing something that wasn't there. Does that make sense? Okay. Genesis 3.6. Um, I have on the screen Exodus 15.9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Okay, so you have, in, again, in this context, this is, I believe this is Pharaoh deciding to chase after the children of Israel, and he said, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. Okay, and you look at the context of what he's saying, I'm going to pursue, I'm going to overtake, I'm going to divide the spoil, I'm... I'm going to draw my sword. I'm going to destroy them. Um, that's, that, those kind of things don't usually, we would say, fall into a good, healthy mental state. You know, that's, those are attitudes to be commended. Okay? And so we don't have the word desire. Uh, my desire shall be dissatisfied. He says my lust because this is, this is a primal, carnal, uh, it, there's an evil context to what he's doing. And so... It's accurately, again, translated as lust rather than desire because the context indicates so. He's, he's got this burning lust inside of him to destroy the Israelites and to avenge the losses that he suffered. Okay? I'm not talking about somebody who has a healthy sense of justice and a healthy sense of right and wrong. I'm talking about somebody who's on a personal vendetta to commit genocide. So we wouldn't categorize that into the perfectly acceptable category. We'd categorize that in a different category. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 12, 15. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. <clears throat> and so... In this passage, and uh, we, could, we could go back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 12 and talk about it, but um, God is dealing with, uh, again, the law, and, and you know he's, he's dealing with the nation of Israel who, out in the wilderness, had spent most of their time complaining about what they didn't have. You know, we don't have the leeks and the garlics and the melons. We want to go back to Egypt, and boy, we don't have water, and we don't have clean water, and we don't have this, and it's too hot, and it's too cold, and it's this and that. And they complained about all of it. And so, you know, their constant griping about at God, even though he provided them food every day, he provided them manna, he provided them quail, he provided them fresh water, he gave them shade, he gave them the fire by night. You know, he took care of everything that they needed. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. I mean, he took care of every need that they had, and yet it was never enough. And so when God is talking to them, he says, whatsoever they soul lusteth after. Again, you have a little bit of a negative context or a negative um, perception of that word. And the idea, again, kind of that word is pointing us to the fact that these, these were not natural desires that, you know, that God put in man and it was okay. These, these are desires that they, they, were, they were coveting after. They, were, they wanted more. They weren't satisfied. This, there was a negative, there's negativity behind it. And so when the translators translated it, they translated it with that negative connotation to it. That it's not just that you desire, you know, to eat meat. It's that 
the meat I'm giving you isn't enough. And so whatever you're lusting after beyond what I've provided for you, you, you just you can eat whatever. And that's that's kind of the context here. So <coughs> all right. Let me see. I don't know how many of these I've put in my slide. I think most of them. Um, okay, Psalm 1910. Somebody want to read that? That one's not in my slides. All right, John, Psalm 1910. While he's looking at that, we'll just look at Psalm 78, 11, which is on your screen. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Okay, again, this harkens back to what we were talking about in Deuteronomy. Whatever God was giving them was never enough, and they complained about it all the time. And so when even when David is recounting the nation of Israel in the wilderness, what we have is a negative connotation to it. They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. They had this desire for more than what God had given them, and that's usually where lust comes in. As human beings, we desire to eat, we desire drink, and we desire companionship, we desire a lot of things that are natural, and God's given us those desires, but when, they go, when we desire what is beyond what God has given us, that becomes lust. And it becomes a negative thing. I'm not satisfied with what God, I'm not satisfied or content with what God has given me. Uh, I want more. I want something beyond what I have. And that's where the negative context kicks in. And you're going to find this word lust. And just about every time you go beyond what God has given, there's a desire beyond the boundaries of what God has given, where it is always going to be translated as lust. Almost always. Um, and so... Uh, again, only in Genesis 3, it's translated desire because you're speaking at it from Eve's perspective. These others are from God's perspective. So again, understanding the perspective helps you understand some of the reasons why they translated a word a particular way. So Psalm 1910, John. Okay, talking about the word of God here, more desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Okay, well, you can't desire the word of God enough. You can't, you can't have a desire for the things of God or the word of God beyond what God intends. He intends for you to desire it all in its full completion, so you can't go beyond that. So we're not lusting after the word of God. We are desiring the word of God. Um, Psalm 81.12 says, So I gave them up into their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. <clears throat> right? Again, what does that sound like? It sounds like people who desired something beyond the boundaries of what God intended, and they were just bound and determined to fulfill their lust, and so God let them go. And that's why the word lust is translated there, or it's translated as lust, is because they're beyond what God intended them to do. Uh, Psalm 106, 14, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Again, hearkening back to the many, many times when they um, caused, complained about God and caused judgment to fall. Uh, and the Bible says they lusted, because they, they desired for things beyond what God had provided. And rather than ask for it, you know, they complained and they murmured. And that never makes God happy. Any questions? I'm going to move over to the New Testament. Does that make sense? Some of you are looking at me like I'm speaking Chinese up here right now. <clears throat> Just watch the subtitles. If they do go into Chinese, you know I was actually speaking Chinese. It's a miracle. Okay. All right, let's move over to the New Testament. A bunch of scripture here again. Actually, no, there's, there's the other two. I don't know how that slide ended up way down here, but there it is. For those of you at home, there it is. You can see it on your screen. Okay, going to um, the New Testament now. We're going to look at Matthew 5.28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Again, the idea of a man looking at a woman and having a sexual desire for her, is, is Jesus indicating that we're talking about a normal, healthy man 
that wants to get married and finds a woman attractive and wants to marry her? Is that, is that the way you would interpret or the, the standpoint? No, because he doesn't say desired. It's not translated desires, translated lust. We're talking about looking at a woman and desiring what is beyond what God has given you. God, if, whether God is, well, if you've committed adultery, that means you're married. So you're looking at a woman who is not the one that God gave you, and thus you are desiring what is beyond what God has given you. And it's pretty much always going to be translated lust when that happens. And that's the distinction between the two. Okay, so when Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, then every man in the room understands the distinction there. We women may not always understand it, but every man understands it. That's why when dad tells your daughter to go back upstairs and get changed, mom, just zip your mouth and tell your daughter to go back up there. And just, Dad knows what he's talking about. Dad understands this verse. Mom doesn't, but dad does. There is a grave difference between the two minds. So that's why he doesn't say if a Man, if a woman looks after a man and lusts, there's a reason it's in disorder. It's because God knows us better than we know ourselves. Mark 4, 19. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Okay. Your desire for things that God has given you or God, things that God has even promised you that you don't yet have those desires are not going to choke the word of God out. It's only when you desire things beyond what God intends for you to have that the word of God gets choked. Okay? If, if you come to God and you want to get saved because you think getting saved will get you a promotion or you think it'll get you rich or it'll make your business successful or something like that, well, that's, that's one, that's not a valid faith or repentance that would get you saved. Uh, but two, you're, you're actually demonstrating the opposite of salvation. You're showing that the word of God is being choked. The word of God promises no such thing to anyone who gets saved. It promises eternal life to those who get saved. It does not promise riches to those who get saved. Contrary to what Joel Osteen will tell you on TV. And some of the other guys that want a $60 million jet to go do the Lord's work. Because you can't do the Lord's work flying coach. Like the rest of us poor schlubs. Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Again, Romans chapter 1, he's talking specifically here about homosexuality in the context. This is beyond what God has given us. And th these desires are beyond the desires God has given us. God, no, God didn't create you that way. God created you to desire the opposite sex. Now, not everybody has that same desire or that same need to get married and, and have a family and all that. We get that, but that doesn't make you a homosexual just because you don't have a desire for the opposite sex. It just means you know, you, God may have chosen you to remain single, and there's nothing sinful or shameful about that doesn't make you a uh, gay or lesbian or any bisexual or anything else. It just, God has given to remain single or to get married to a member of the opposite sex. Anything beyond that is going to fall into the lust category. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. What is Paul saying here? I wouldn't even know what lust is. I wouldn't know how to distinguish lust from desire except the law put a limit on what I'm allowed to desire. And once I go beyond what the law per permits, now I'm into lust. I wouldn't know that my desire to eat the 18th piece of cake was wrong except, you know, gluttony is, is a sin and, and we're not, you know, supposed to do that. Uh, so you have all of these things that, uh, and, and we're going to keep going because there's plenty more and I have time to fill. So nothing better to fill our time with than the word of God.
Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? Now, if you walk in the Spirit, you will still get hungry and eat food. You probably got hungry and ate dinner before you came to church tonight. You get thirsty and you get something to drink. Okay? Walking in the Spirit does not negate all human desire. It only negates the human desires that go beyond the boundaries of the Word of God when it becomes law. Okay? Ephesians 4.22 um, he says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And a lot of times our desires, we, we get deceived into thinking that it's okay to desire something that God had said. That's what happened to Eve. God said no, but Eve began to think that no actually meant yes and that this was really a good thing and that Maybe God intended for her to have this after all, and that's why she, it, the Bible says she desired it. It was desired. Uh, it was a tree to be desired, not a tree to be lusted for. She thought it was a good. The, our lust, our desires, especially the ones that go beyond, our hearts deceitful above all things. Sometimes we, sometimes we we trick ourselves and lie to ourselves and tell us ourselves that. Oh, no, God really didn't draw the line there. We get sucked into something we shouldn't. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace uh, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Again, you contrast lust to the things that are right and good. Um, James 1.15, Actually, 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So these are not people who desire to hear the word of God and heap to themselves teachers so they can just enjoy the, the hearing of the word of God more. These are people who are not satisfied with what they're getting in sound doctrine, and so because they desire beyond sound doctrine and what God has said, it's described as lust. They lust after. And so they heap to themselves the wrong kind of teachers who will tell them things that they want to hear, not things that they don't want to hear. That's why the word appears there, James 1.15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. It doesn't say desire, it says lust, because when you desire the things that God has given you, that's a good thing, you can't, be, you can't be tricked or tempted into sin with what God has given you. It's only when you go beyond what God has given you that you're going to be tempted into sin. First, uh, First Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Again, we're not talking about basic human desires here. We're talking about going beyond what God has permitted. And then the last two, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Jude 1, 18. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. And so, and, and again, this is not all of the passages. This is just a big sampling of them from both the Old and the New Testament. You can see that how the context dictates the translation. In the Greek or the Hebrew, it might have been understood without the need to use separate words. It was understood without the need to use separate words. In English, that may not have been the case, and it probably wasn't the case, which is why they used two different words, one to deal with the negative beyond what God has given us, and then the other to deal with what is natural and normal and okay. That's just how linguistics work. You cannot just do word-for-word -word translations and get the same idea to come from it. You have to take into account that what is being communicated, because <clears throat> if I say something in English, doesn't mean they're going to understand it in Spanish if they translate it word-for-word. -word. I think I've used this example before, but we had a staff meeting several months ago 
maybe six months ago now, and uh, and I just said, uh, Pastor Chacon was in there, and, and I just said, you know, well, we have to stop kicking the can down the road. We need to make a decision. Well, he, he heard the words in English, and he, in his head he translated that into Spanish, and then he looked to Susan, and he said something in Spanish, and she, she said something back to him in Spanish, and they went back and forth for a second, and, and she, she stopped me. She said, he, he didn't understand what that meant. He understands kicking, and he understands the word kick and can and road. Those were not the issue. The issue was I said something that conveyed a thought or a message that didn't translate word for word into Spanish. And so I had to explain that that meant to procrastinate. You know, it's the idea of, you know, we're just, instead of picking the can up and throwing it in the trash, we're just kicking it down the road and just, you know, trying to de delay something. Um, and so he understood that. Okay. Well, the Bible has idioms in it. It has idiomatic phrases and things in it that don't necessarily convey, when you translate it word for word, don't necessarily convey the thought. And so the translators took that into account. They translated it so we would understand what was being said, not just have the word in the, in the English language, but we would have the correct English word for that. And so you will have a, a word that's translated several different ways to convey the thought in English accurately. Okay, so it's not, it wasn't, they, they didn't sit around and flip a coin. Do we want lust or desire here, guys? Well, we haven't used, we haven't used desire in a while. Let's use that one. Um, that's, it wasn't haphazard. There was a process that they went through to determine what is the correct English word that properly conveys the thought of this word in this context, in this passage of Scripture just like they did with the word charity and the word love. It's, they're both agape. Every time the word charity is found in the scripture, it's agape, which is translated love everywhere but Romans 13. First, yeah, Romans, Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 13. In some chapter 13, somewhere in the New Testament, it's translated as charity. Um, but that is because it's a unique context, and, and the word love did not accurately and completely express the thought behind it in the Greek. So they chose a different word, charity, and translated it that way. And it's okay. There's no problem with your King James Bible. There's no problem with, with the Greek or the Hebrew language. It's just you cannot go word for word from one language to another. It doesn't work that way. And the people who think that you can do it that way um, don't understand linguistics. And I only speak English. I can say enough to get myself into trouble in a few other languages, get myself punched somewhere, or look like an idiot in about four or five different languages. But, you know, I, I haven't studied linguistics. I'm not an expert on it. But I do know that, and I do know that you can't, um, you can't just word for word it, because you will not convey the thought accurately when you do that. So, any questions? All right, well, I'm going to take five minutes then, because this was asked of me. Uh, it's been asked a couple times since I started this series, so I'm going to uh, answer this too, where people will ask about the words in our King James Bible that are in italics. Why are there some words in italics and some words that are in regular font? Well, it's because the words in italics, there is not a corresponding Greek or Hebrew word to them, but it's understood grammatically in the sentence. Uh, and so the example of this, um, and I took two years of Latin, this is the extent of what I remember from back in the dinosaur days when I took, took Latin. Um, in Latin, Greek has some similarities to it. I'm not sure about Hebrew because I, I really haven't studied Hebrew that much, know too much about grammar in Hebrew, but I've studied a little bit of Greek and, and I understand grammar in, in Latin um, pretty well. And so if I was sitting at a table with my wife and we were on a date and we were in first century Rome and we were Romans and spoke Latin, I could just simply look at her and say, a mo. 
And what I've just said to her is, I love you, even though I only used one word. Okay? A mo in a sentence means I love. And then you can tack on whoever. But if I'm sitting there looking her in the eye, I don't have to tack on the other stuff. That was the cool thing about Latin. They didn't use a lot of articles and pronouns and a bunch of stuff like that. They were all built into the grammar of, of the verbs. So the verb would dis determine whether it was masculine or feminine, whether it was singular or plural, first, second, or third person. And so with one ending, a change in the ending, I could go from I love you to we love you or you love you or we, he, she, it loves you or they love you. All I have to do is change the ending of, of am, whether it's a mo or a mos, and you can go down through the other declensions and you know, and, and do that. And so there is some similarities to that where there's not a separate word for that word in italics in Hebrew or in Greek, but it is understood properly in English. It's built into the word, the, the grammar, the, the other articles, the other pronouns, the other subjects, things like that are built into the grammar of the sentence. So the translators in the King James Bible, just to be honest, and up front, they put those words in italics. They distinguish those words from the other words by putting them in italics to say, okay, there's the word that is, there's not a, the word that is not actually in the Hebrew in this sentence. There's not a separate word for that, but it is understood in the sentence when you translate it into English. The word that would have to be there in order to complete the sentence. And so in English, we're going to put the word that, but we're going to distinguish it from the other words that are have a corresponding word to it. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, you cannot just translate word from word, word for word from language to language and convey the thought, and convey the thought in, in an intelligent and you know, complete way. It just doesn't work that way. We, sometimes we think it does, but it doesn't. That's why you have words that are in italics in the Bible. Um, so it doesn't mean they shouldn't be there. They should be there to properly understand it in English, but they're not there in the Greek or the Hebrew. Now does anyone have any questions? I did that in three minutes. I'm on a roll today. Okay, you all want to finish early for a change? Fine, we'll finish early for a change. All right, yes, that was the last slide. I am correct, and we have completed that one. Again, if you would like to add a word um, to the study or a couple of words to the study, um, just fill out a Pew Connection card. Uh, either give it to me or drop it in the offering box. I will have it on Sunday for sure. Okay, does anybody need a prayer list? I think we just changed over to a new prayer list. My wife is going to bring it to you. She's that nice. Yes. Okay. All right, well, a jot and a tittle it refers to Hebrew. Um, and again, it, depending on many Hebrew symbols or letters or words, they look identical except there might be a little, little extra line on it and that makes it a whole different letter or gives it a different tense or something like that. Um, much, much like our capital T and our F, our capital F, they're very similar. If you take that little half bar off the F in the middle and put it at the top, it's a T. But we immediately recognize that and say, one's a T, one's an F. They each have their own sound. And it makes a difference where that little bar is to understand the word properly and spell it properly. So in the Hebrew, it's the same way. You take a little thing off one side and put it on the other. Or you move it down into another corner. All of a sudden, it's, it's an entirely different thing. And so Jesus, all he was saying is, you know, not even the smallest of punctuation or accent is going to be lost, that doesn't mean that the, italic, the italicized words in the Bible are in violation of that because 
he's talking about the Hebrew language. If he was talking about the English language, he, he, would, he would have said something different entirely. But he was talking about Hebrew, which has jots and tittles. We don't have jots and tittles in English. And most of our letters are not that closely associated. That one little closest thing would be a T and an F, and those are pretty easily distinguished. Some of the Hebrew letters, I mean, I have to look at them three times and go, oh, no, wait a minute, that's... I'm seeing that wrong. It's one of the reasons I don't have any desire to study Hebrew. It's, it's very uh, challenging. And I do not have a pen. Anybody have an extra pen? Because nine times out of ten, I'll stick one in my pocket. One out of every ten, I'm saying, does somebody have a pen? Right. Any other questions? Uh, we'll give you a couple announcements and then uh, we'll go to our prayer list. Uh, have some time of prayer here at the end. Um, so we dropped off um, the 12,494 John and Romans that are going to New Albany. Those were dropped off yesterday. And um, I, I, if you ever wonder how the Postal Service could lose a billion dollars every quarter, Come with me next time we drop off the John and Romans. Uh, real quickly, before we took the first pallet down a couple weeks ago, I went down with our paperwork, with a John and Romans. I showed it to them. This is what we're mailing. Here, here's, here it is. We, is this correct? Yes. Here's our paperwork. Have I filled it out correct? Yes. That, that's what we want. Um, and, and all of that. And so on my, we picked up all the trays and the pallet so we could do our Super Saturday and bundle them all. And I, as I was actually getting ready to walk out the door the last time, one of the employees stopped me and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and we have a question. So I came over, yes. Are these all going to the same zip code on one pallet? Yes. So there's nothing else on this pallet other than one zip code. It's all going, we don't have to open it or nothing. Yes. Okay, well, if you, if you print off part F on this form, then you get a discount and showed me how to fill that out and all of that. And it'll say, I mean, first one it was like $66 we save, and then this one was like $87. And so it's like, you know, it's seven-tenths of a cent, but seven-tenths of a cent times 350000 adds up. Okay, so cool. Well, thank you. I had never met a public servant who was helpful before. A, a bureaucrat, I don't mean the first responders, I mean like the bureaucrats. I've never met a helpful bureaucrat before, so this was a new, new experience. So I went back and I changed the paperwork and did exactly what they said and marked them all, and I took them down, and, and they, you know, they're doing their thing to receive it, and they have to weigh the pallet, and they, you know, they had to do a few things, just I don't know why the weight is on there, the weight of the John and Romans is on there. They have you weigh 10 of the units and then put down the weight on there and then how many units and do all this. So, I mean, it's all readily available. And then they have you multiply that out for the weight on the whole pallet. So, but then they have you weigh the pallet. And it's just, so they, they pull out the John and Romans and they're measuring it. And, and granted, I was there an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm giving you the short version here. Well, you, you have these marked as, you're, you're trying to send these as a flat instead of a letter. But these meet the qualifications of a letter. And, you know, as long as it's within the qualification of a letter, we have to stop there. And so, you know, these have to go as letters. Okay. Well, cool. That saves me one-tenth of a cent because they charge one-tenth of a cent more to send a flat than a, than a letter. So I thought, okay, cool. I'm saving another one-tenth of a cent. So I have to change a bunch of stuff on there. And then they say, oh, and part F is only for the flat, so you, don't, you can't take the discount when you're sending a letter. Okay, I, I was just in here two weeks ago, and you told me I qualified for it. Now you tell me I don't. Okay, whatever. Hour and ten minutes. They received it. We paid. They took the pallet. Go back yesterday. I, the same two employees that I dealt with last week. She gets it out. We pull it up on the scale. She's doing her thing. 
And then she does this with the John and Romans. And I thought, uh oh. See, on the back of our John and Romans, it, the, the placarding that they call it with the imprint and all of that, this is how you would hold it to read it. So now when you measure the height, it exceeds that of a letter and that makes it a flat. So I had to redo all of my paperwork again and have them print part F so I could take the discount that they disallowed last time because they told me it was a letter. And they remembered last week that they told me it was a letter, but now it's a flat. And you wonder why they lose a billion dollars a quarter. I'm filling the paperwork out both ways. And when we get there, I'm going to let them tell me, is it a flat or a letter this week? And then I'm going to give them that paperwork so I don't have to fill it out again. Because you have to redo all of the postage calculations. There's different pieces of parts. That you, it's like your tax return. You have your main page. Then you have all the other things that have to go with it, your schedules and stuff. So you know, if it's a letter, then you part C. If it's a flat, it's part F. And the postage is different. And the discounts are different. And uh, all of that, even though So we will see in the future whether we will play, is it a flat or is it a letter? Tune in for the next episode of, is it a flat or is it a letter? So I'm just going to fill the paperwork out both ways, bring in two sets, and just ask them, flip a coin, tell me what it is. I give you the paper. Can I get out of here in under an hour? This is the bonus round now. Can I get out under an hour with my third pallet? So... Praise the Lord. It's, they're hopefully being delivered, except we got two in the mail back here at the church of our own John and Romans that were sent to the 43231 zip code, not even our zip code. We, we, we shrink wrap these, and, and they put this big sign on there that says, do not machine, because they just, they're, they're not addressed. They just go one to every house, so you don't don't have to get the right one to the right house. You just pull one out and stick it in every mailbox. So do not machine. They put this big thing on there. We had two that they ran through a machine, and they, it read it as addressed to us and mailed it back to us. It is in God's hands. We have done everything that we can do. We are not responsible for the U.S. Postal Service. Could be, I don't know. Or it could be that somebody in the 43231 zip code can't read and ran their batch through the machine, which then read it as mailed to us and mailed two of them back to us from another zip code. Have mercy. So, if you ever wonder, yes, pray that they're actually delivering these. We, I have gotten word that people have gotten them, so. <sighs> All right, so there's my horror story. And uh, we could probably raise money for this project by taking bets on who, which is it going to be a flat or is it, you know, we'll lay odds. I'll tell, which way are they holding it this week? Oh, it's leaning towards a letter. Oh, wait a minute. Nope, it's going to be a flat. <laughs> oh, nope, it's going to be a letter. So, same two, not two different employees at the same office, the same two employees at the same office. Can't. They have to go to the BMEU and, at CityGate. It's the only place you can drop bulk mail. Anyway, praise the Lord. We love them. We pray for them to get saved. I think next time I'm just going to start witnessing to them. That will speed the process along. Hurry up. Let's get this guy out of here. All right. A couple things. Um, so be in prayer for the ones going out, the ones that have gone out. Uh, 22,000 have gone out. Two of them have come back to us. I don't know who didn't get theirs, but... 
Um, so pray for them as they go out and um, pray that we not have any more snafus along the way. Um, if you're interested in being in choir, practice has started. We're, um, we're going over some of the openers that we've learned and uh, going, we're going to be doing um, some songs for, uh, a couple songs for revival that we've done before and our Christmas songs are going to come from songs that we pretty much already know. So no big heavy cantata this year. It's going to be uh, going to be a little easier, and uh, so more the merrier. And again, if you can't sing, you're welcome to stand up there and just move your mouth quietly. Um, owls are having their brunch at 9:30 in the morning uh, here on Friday, and Bill and Diana right over there. If you'd like to come, and they're going to we're going to be uh, they're going to be bundling some John and Romans to start the 43230 zip code. We're going to take that down on three different pallets about 9,000 or so um, per pallet. So um, as we get one done, we'll get it out. I think I'm trying to get the next one out by Wednesday, October 12th, I think is the date. So a couple, couple three weeks from tonight. And uh, again, we can get 9,000 done fairly quickly. So come Friday, we're going to put a big dent in it and uh, get that next pallet ready to go. Um, Oh, uh, so a um, couple of the, I know the Chacon kids and um, uh, Annalise, uh, they have a fundraiser going at school. It's a walkathon uh, to raise money for their school. If you're interested in sponsoring them, just go see one of them and uh, let them know. Uh, you can ask them all the questions you want. Um, uh, our, I'll reiterate for the parents in the room, um, and we, we pass this along if you know somebody that this would apply to, but um, when, when kids are doing fundraisers for their schools and that, what I don't want kids going around and soliciting donations. That's not why we come to church. Uh, and we have enough kids and more kids coming in all the different schools, and I don't want people to walk in. Every time they walk into church, there's a different kid standing there raising money for a different thing. We feel pressured to say yes or no. So uh, what we want to do is let me know that your kid is raising money, and if it's, you know, if it's the school dance, I'm sorry, we're not going to help out with that, okay? Um, but if it's, if it's a, a good project and nothing that's going to uh, contradict what we believe from the Bible, then we'd be happy to help out with that. But let me know. I'll announce it and, and tell people to go see your kids, and they can stand in the lobby as people come out with the paper so that people see that and are reminded, but... But while it's going on here at church, on the church property, we just, not, we just don't want the kids running around just asking for donations all the time. You're welcome to call everybody in the church at home, or you're welcome to text them, email them, whatever, and uh, do that on your own outside the church. However you want to do that, that's fine. Uh, but here at church, that's how we're going to do it. So we don't have, um, don't create any issues and problems, and people don't uh, get annoyed with it if it gets to be a lot. We don't have a lot of that going on. I'm thankful for that, but that's going. That's the policy, and uh, that's what we'll do going forward. So if you have any questions, just let me know, and um, we'll do that from there. So I'm trying to get that, that word out and just making sure everyone's on the same page with it, not trying to single anybody out or uh, any particular fundraiser out. All right. Be in prayer for Brother Willette. Um, talk to him today. Um, he is he is doing well, but his voice is weak. Um, but he's preaching. The amount of preaching he does doesn't change anything. Uh, it's just because of the the cancer that he's had and his uh, on his larynx and the treatments that he's had. It's just left his voice um, really weak, and so. He called just to make sure I still wanted to have him come. He more than wanted to come, and so we went, we're going to go ahead and keep the meeting, and uh, he's going to come, and we'll, we'll adjust the microphone accordingly, but uh, he's expecting to continue to make progress and get better between now and then, so you be in prayer for him that God would give him back his voice and um, he'd be able to get back to the preaching that he's done in the past, at least the volume of preaching that he's done in the past, so... Uh, you'd be in prayer for him. I know he'd appreciate it. All right. I think that's it on the announcements. Um, let's get to the prayer list.